The Where Our Minds Wanda podcast may contain sensitive content and explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Greetings, fellow wanderers, to the places our minds wander. Where strange lights speed beyond reason across a clear night sky. The house at the end of the road where disembodied voices whisper and strange noises make the living shiver. Lurking shadows hiding on the edge of the woods just outside your back door. Odd true events throughout time that lead you down the rabbit hole. I'm Wes. And I'm Beth. And this is where our minds wander. So this is the first podcast that we've ever done, and we're pretty excited about it. We're really excited. We're both interested in usual weird topics, and perhaps you are too. So get your favorite beverage, pull up a comfy seat, and let us tell you what we found interesting today. So, what do you think of when you think of England? Tea and carpets. Okay, what else? Castles. Okay, what else? Damsels in distress. <laughs> in in a garden, right? Oh, yeah, sure, in the garden. Okay, well, I think of gardens when I think of England. I think of lush, green, light gravel walkways, hedgerows, iron benches, a place to spread out a blanket and read some Shelley or Wordsworth, and a respite from the busy, hectic stress of everyday life. Then perhaps the Alnwick Garden in Northumberland, England, isn't for me, because it's a garden that could kill me. I'm talking about the Alnwick Poison Garden. Ooh, that sounds interesting. It is, and she's so cool. When Jane Percy's brother-in-law, the 11th Duke of Northumberland, passed away suddenly in 1995, she and her husband became the new Duchess and Duke of the Northeastern England County. They moved to Alnwick Castle, the traditional home of the Duke of Northumberland, which was the building used as Hogwarts in the first two Harry Potter movies, by the way. Percy was then tasked with redeveloping the grounds around the landmark castle. Over the next several years, the Duchess and her team of landscape architects transformed the empty space into a world-class attraction, featuring sculptures, waterfalls, vibrant plant life, the typical garden you would expect. Today, Jane is 63, and Alnwick Castle houses the largest collection of European plants in the UK. Jane started the Poison Garden in 2005 as part of the 12-acre Normal Gardens after she visited Padua, Italy. She went to a garden there cultivated for a sinister purpose. In an interview with NPR, she said, I found out that it had been built by the Medicis, to find more effective ways of killing their enemies. The Medicis held enormous power in Italy between the 15th and 18th centuries, and they didn't always obtain it through ethical means. According to rumors, they used poison to take out their political rivals, even those who belonged to their own family. The gate had a skull and crossbones on them, Percy recalled, and I loved the idea, she said. So I mean this in the most respectful way, but she sounds a little nutty, so I totally love her. While visiting the ruins of Sutra Medieval Hospital in Scotland, Percy also learned about 500-year-old sponges soaked with henbane, opium, and hemlock that were recovered at the site. Each sponge contained just the right quantity to anesthetize someone for 48 to 72 hours, the amount of time it took to perform amputations. That's when her idea was born. She said, quote, The line between kill and cure is what I'm interested in. The story of how plants can cure I find pretty boring, really. It's much better to know how a plant kills. End quote. But poisons weren't just for medieval families, obviously. In 1978, a member of the Bulgarian secret police used an umbrella tip to inject rice in, a powerful poison extracted from the beans of a castor plant, into the leg of a political dissident as he walked down a London street. And yes, a castor plant grows in Alnwick's poison garden. 
Percy's goal with her poison garden wasn't to explore the medical benefits of plants at all, but rather to foster an understanding among the visitors that many plants can be toxic. The Duchess is particular, particularly interested in telling children about the killing power of these plants. She said, quote, If you're a child, who cares that aspirin comes from the bark of a tree? It's far more interesting that in Victorian times, children had something called killing jars. The jars held laurel leaves, which killed spiders or butterflies, but left them intact, which was great for collectors, end quote. Visitors to the Poison Garden are met by black iron gates with two signs which read, These plants can kill, complete with skull, skull and crossbones, just like she said she wanted. Her head gardener, Trevor Jones, says, They're not allowed to stand too close to the plants. He's talking about visitors. Right, right. They're not allowed to smell them or touch them or taste any of them, thankfully, because they all have the ability to kill you. We only take 20 people in at a time so that the guide can see everybody and see exactly what they're up to and can take control. So what's growing behind these black iron gates? Pretty much everything you can think of and some stuff that would totally surprise you. So for example, it doesn't take many berries from Atropa belladonna or deadly nightshade to kill someone. The plant is common in England and growing quite happily in the poison garden. The Duchess also warns that merely brushing up against the bushy green Ruta graviolens, commonly called rue, or touching the sap from euphorbia can give a person a nasty rash. An accidental brush with giant hogweed can cause serious burns and extreme sun sensitivity for up to seven years. Ingesting henbane trigger, triggers hallucinations, and inhaling its putrid scent causes lightheadedness. Visitors are forbidden from smelling the plants, but 20 to 30 people still pass out in the garden every year. Oh my God, that's awesome. <laughs> the garden also has a special permit to grow coca plants and marijuana plants. Both are enclosed in metal cages with closed circuit TV cameras pointed at them at all times. So you can't go home with pockets full of weed? No, no, no. That would be trouble at the airport. One of the more disturbing lessons taught at the Poison Garden is that deadly plants are more common than many people realize. Percy has watched backyard gardeners walk through the grounds many times and spot plants they recognize from their own yards. They will often remark, those can't be poisonous. Percy frequently responds, well, I've got that in my garden, and I could tell you how to kill with it. <laughs> and she doesn't actually tell visitors how to kill people, by the way. But she does share that a powerful poison can be made from Helleborus. Extracts from Helleborus were once actually used in low doses to help children expel intestinal worms. Except, when the kids were given too much, it killed them. Other common plants like foxglove, castor beans, laurel, they can be found growing in home gardens too. Even the plants we eat contain minimal amounts of toxins, like potatoes, which are a relative of the belladonna. They're dangerous when they turn green. The shells of cashews have a similar effect on human skin as poison ivy, which is why the nuts are always sold naked. You have no comment about <laughs> naked, naked nuts. nuts. <laughs> no, not whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> the common garden plant laurel was used frequently in the 19th century. Children would catch insects and trap them in killing jars containing a single laurel leaf. Toxic, toxic fumes from the plant would, would asphyxiate the creature, leaving their wings and body intact so the child could display it. Percy says... Hopefully it doesn't encourage them to go out and kill things, but helps them to understand and appreciate the power of these plants. Percy's personal favorite poisonous plant is Datura, or Devil's Trumpet. The Aztecs fed it to people they intended to sacrifice to make them feel pleasantly, pleasantly disoriented before their violent death. The Victorians kept Datura flowers on their tables and tapped the pollen into their teacups to enjoy the psychotropic effects. Morphine from the poppy plant and strychnine from the strychnine tree are both dangerous toxic alkaloids. 
terpenes, the compounds that give plants like pine and lavender their signature scent, and acetic acids, the compounds plants and animals use to make fats, can also serve as the starting points for plant toxins. So, of course, cultivating this collection of the world's deadliest plants does pose some challenges. Because many of the plants are dangerous to touch or smell, her gardeners must don gloves, face shields, and hazmat suits just to take care of them. Some specimens even require special permits. Alnwick Garden does have a license to grow the marijuana in the pot that, well, marijuana and pot's the same thing. (laughs) The cocaine and marijuana that they grow. But at the end of the season, plants like cannabis must be destroyed. Percy says, the gardeners are all meant to wear their masks when they're burning the pot plants. I've never been around to see that actually happen. (laughs) I bet they destroy it. (laughs) According to Mental Floss, Percy has also said, quote, I think it's one of the only poison gardens in the world. To me, that doesn't make sense. If you're trying to educate, which we are, you grab children's attention with how a plant kills, and how gruesome the death is, and how painful it is, and whether you vomit before you die. You know, the whole process. (laughs) Oh, such a great lesson for children. She continues, I never wanted to do anything that other people had done before. It had to be either unique, or it had to be better. So I want to go there. Me too. Bucket list. We should go there. That is a bucket list. And I'm wondering, just how many families do you think take those pesky in-laws, say father-in-laws, mother-in-laws, <laughs> <laughs> to, to the poisonous garden? To the poison gardens. garden. Get a little closer so I can take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> Breathe the air in. Doesn't it smell nice? Yes. Well... <laughs> I learned something new today. Yes. And what I also think is cool. A destination place for the (laughs) in-laws. What I also think is cool. I didn't, I didn't talk about it at all, but they have a witch's hut right outside the gate. And I guess it, it's set up to have like potion bottles and things like that. You get your souvenirs. Yeah. I don't know if there's any souvenirs from the Samples to bring home to the (laughs) in-laws. Hey, did you know? Frederick Bauer dreamed up the original Pringles can. Now, he's buried in one. Or at least part of him is. Not all of him, just part. In 1966, Bauer came up with a clever way for Procter & Gamble to stack chips uniformly rather than tossing them in a bag. He was so proud of the achievement, he wanted to go to his grave with it. So, when Bauer died last month, his children buried the 89-year-old's ashes in one of his iconic cans. When my dad first raised the burial idea in the 1980s, I chuckled about it, said Bauer's oldest son, Larry, to Time magazine. Larry Bauer quickly realized his father was serious. Family jokes circulated about the Pringles plan, but no one questioned the elder Bauer's decision. So when Frederick Bauer died after a battle with Alzheimer's, Larry and his siblings stopped at Walgreens for a burial can of Pringles on their way to the funeral home. Quote, My siblings and I briefly debated what flavor to use, Bauer said. But I said, look, we need to use the original. So they did. Who'd have thunk it? The Exeter Vampire The emaciated figure strikes one with terror, the forehead covered in drops of sweat, the cheeks painted with a livid crimson, the eyes sunken in. Symptoms progressed as if someone or something were draining the life and the blood of the victim. In Exeter, Rhode Island, in 1884, 20-year-old Mary Olive Brown began having horrific nightmares as if an oppressive weight sat upon her chest as she slept. Five years later, her brother Edwin begins dreaming of suffocation and drowning, crying out in his fevered sleep. She is here, and she wants me to come with her. She haunts me. Welcome to Exeter, Rhode Island, 1892, and the terrible case of the American vampire. George Brown was a farmer. 
He and his wife Mary worked the farm with their children, Mary Olive and Edwin, and their youngest daughter, Mercy, who everyone called her by her middle name, Lena. Miss Brown became ill and passed away in 1883, followed quickly by 20-year-old Mary Olive. Edwin, George, and Lena carried on, encompassed by grief. It was 1889 when both Edwin and Lena fell ill, coughing uncontrollably, bringing up foamy blood and white phlegm. Their eyes became sunken and their bodies emaciated. Edwin, once a sturdy and strong young man, heard about the restorative air and mineral waters of Colorado Springs, and he left his family for the West. He stayed in Colorado for 18 months before homesickness brought him home, back to Rhode Island and the family far, but he was in far worse condition than when he had left. Lena passed away in 1892 at age 19 of this ravaging illness that turned her into a skeleton of her former self. Edwin, almost seemingly succumbing to the same sickness that had taken the life of his mother and two sisters, was bedridden. His father, George, often consulted doctor in Whitford, Harold Metcalf, but there was little the doctor could do. George's friends and neighbors, however, had other ideas. Steeped in super superstition and fear, they came to George with a cause and a solution. One of his deceased family members was certainly a vampire and needed to be stopped. George, of course, was overcome with grief at the loss of his wife and daughters and the impending loss of his son. However, he refused at first to allow his friends and neighbors to do what they proposed, exhumed the bodies of the women and remove their hearts. George did not place much belief in the old-time theory and resisted their persistent pleas. Perhaps grief overtook him or depression, but for whatever, whatever reason, he gave in and the bodies of his wife and two daughters were exhumed, and the examination was done under the direction of Dr. Harold Metcalf of Whitford. Neither bedridden, bedridden Ed, Edwin or distraught George were present at, as the bodies were exhumed, but friends and neighbors were. First they brought up Mary's coffin, prying the lid and revealing decomposed bones. Satisfied, they moved on to Mary Olive, whose corpse showed similar decay. Convinced that neither of the women were the culprit, the townsfolk urged Dr. Metcalf to move on to Lena, who the world remembers as Mercy. Accounts differ as to whether Lena was buried or awaiting burial in the crypt, but either way, when they removed the coffin's lid, they were appalled at the sight. Lena lay on her side, her cheeks flushed with a rosy glow, as if she was merely sleeping. Dr. Metcalf tried to assure the townsfolk that this was normal. I mean, due to the cold temperatures and Lena being dead for only just eight weeks, but they refused to listen. She had to be a vampire, the one who was tormenting Edwin, and without a doubt would move on to the members of the town. They demanded that her heart and liver be removed from her body. Her still blood-filled heart caused them even greater alarm. Stones were piled nearby and firewood laid upon them. They placed her two organs on top, of the t on top and the townspeople watched as they dissolved to ashes once the fire took hold. Lena was reburied, as were Mary and Mary Olive. As for the cremated or organs, well, <laughs> they were mixed up with water and given to Edwin to drink, with the firm belief that this concoction would add undead Lena's thirst for his blood and life force. Edwin died two months later on May 2nd, 1892, of the tuberculosis that also killed his mother and sisters. Tuberculosis was a major cause of death in the U.S. from the 1700s to the mid-1900s. Highly misunderstood, the disease often wiped out entire families and towns. But despite the townspeople not knowing what TB really was or how to protect themselves from it, they assumed it was the work of a vampire. Vampire lore was rich in Europe, of course, and made its way across the ocean to North America. According to Michael E. Bell in his book, Food for the Dead, New England vampires were not the walking undead of Stoker's Dracula, but rather a spiritual kind of vampire, connecting spiritually with the living. It seemed more likely that desperate townspeople, frantic for any cure, were willing to try any remedy. It's estimated that at certain points in U.S. history, 70 to 90 percent of the population had either latent or active tuberculosis. The bottom line is that people all over the world were attempted to rid the towns of these vampires, 
Whether walking undead or spiritual zappers, it was more widespread than one would like to think. An early documented case is that of Reverend Justice Forward, who in 1788 had lost three daughters to the White Plague. His remaining two daughters, one who was also named Mercy, were battling the disease when he agreed to exhume his deceased loved ones. In a letter he wrote, he said, Since I began to search, I concluded to search further, and this morning I opened the grave of one of my daughters, who had died almost six years ago. On opening the body, the lungs were not dissolved, but the blood in them, though not fresh, was clotted. The lungs did not appear as one would suppose they would be, at a far nearer state of soundness than that could be expected. The liver, I am told, was as sound as the lungs. We put the lungs and the liver in a separate box and buried it, in the same grave, ten inches to a foot above the coffin. But this didn't save Mercy, however. His other daughter did survive, and so a gruesome precedent was set, one by which word of mouth or through medical journals made it far and wide. There are many more examples besides Mercy Lena Brown. Henry David Thor wrote in his journal in 1859, The savage man is never quite eradicated. I have just read of a family in Vermont who several of its members, having died of consumption, just burned the lungs and the heart and the liver of the last deceased in order to prevent any more from having it. All these stories are mind-numbing, not just exhuming loved ones to remove and burn their organs. That's disturbing enough. But to harbor suspicion that loved ones are spiritually attacking others and claiming them dead seems almost equally as disturbing to me. Why would so many wish revenge and suffering and death on their families? Or do these people think it was beyond the dead person's controls and other elements were at fault? And why is the tale of Mercy Brown so well known? Out of all the many stories? Well, perhaps because she was young and easily romanticized. Perhaps because she was reportedly the last person to endure such rituals as the true case of TB was discovered a decade earlier. A little food for thought. I ran across several references to Bram Stoker, possibly modeling his character of Lucy after Mercy Brown, who he had supposedly was familiar with, as her story made international news at the time. It seems plausible for sure. But Stoker began writing Jacqueline in 1885, which predates the Mercy Brown event, so I'm not quite sure how accurate that is. But Stoker was well-versed with medical advancements of the day and certainly aware of TB and other infectious diseases. It's been strongly suggested by scholars that Stoker was personifying diseases such as tuberculosis and the character of Dracula himself. The pale skin, sunken in eyes, rasp of the voice, Count Dracula was literally something draining the life and the blood of the victim. And of course, Van Helsing, of course, would personify the different treatments being tried at the time as well. All very interesting. So my sources were from History.com, Small State Big History, All That's Interesting.com, MentalFloss.com, and Wikipedia. Wow, that was interesting. It doesn't seem like the name Mercy was the luckiest choice, though, for their daughters. <laughs> no, it makes me wonder how many people after that were superstitious about uh, naming their daughters Mercy. <laughs> Probably quite a few. But... You know, it's no wonder people were so desperate because TB decimated entire towns so quickly and completely. It probably didn't seem so far-fetched to think it was supernatural, especially when the symptoms mimicked the folklore about vampires. And Mercy wasn't the only one, right? No, there were cases prior to that as well. Throughout the 1850s, uh, vampirism was breaking out in Rhode Island, Connecticut, Maine, and Vermont. And these weren't just reports or sightings. These in incidents are, are all found in official town records. They're part of New England history. Wow. So people could find out more, couldn't they, if they wanted to? Yeah, all they got to do is dive into the interweb. <laughs> and you can check our sources for more information, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that about wraps it up for this episode. We hope to see all you wanderers again next week. Yeah, see you soon.
Thank you for joining us. We look forward to traveling with you again to the places where our minds wander. If you like what you heard, please take a minute and provide us with a five-star rating and a comment. It really helps us move up the list so people can find us. See you next week for an all-new episode.